at the start of the Syrian revolution, the phrase was Assad or we burn the country. And it seems like by the end of it, it was Assad versus the whole country. Um, I honestly haven't spoken to anyone who isn't ecstatic at what's happened in the last 24 hours. Welcome. If you just joined us, let's turn to the latest in the historic events unfolding in Syria with a direct report from Gareth Brown, Middle East correspondent for The Economist, who we spoke to yesterday. He was in Beirut and now he is one of the first foreign journalists in Damascus. Gareth, good afternoon. Afternoon, how are you doing? I'm very well. Gareth, we spoke to you yesterday in Beirut. You made it to Damascus. What was that journey like? Yeah, it was incredible. You know, there was a, a huge amount of traffic. Um, Syrians in Lebanon trying to get back into Syria. Everyone, you know, had the same idea as us. So we, we had a huge amount of traffic to deal with. We got stamped out of Lebanon very easily. And then, you know, we went with our passports to um, get stamped into Syria. And the Syrian authorities just weren't there. So we drove onwards to um, Damascus. The streets were pretty deserted. There were some rebel fighters, lots of abandoned Syrian regime posts, um, people celebrating in the streets. We saw a few you know, old Syrian Soviet tanks, which were smoldering. And, and something you really noticed as you came down the hill into Damascus proper on the street, hundreds and hundreds of military uniforms. And these are the army uniforms that Assad soldiers shed uh, last night, you know, as the army collapsed, you know, in just a matter of hours, really heaps of, of, of military fatigues. Um, Damascus is very quiet now. You know, HTS, this rebel group, which has kind of spearheaded the assault from the north, have imposed a general curfew that came in, you know, just over an hour ago. So not many people on the streets. Um, but it's an interesting time to be here. What is the atmosphere in Damascus at the moment? You, you've said that there, there is a curfew but we've been looking at pictures of people celebrating. We've also been looking at pictures of people entering government buildings, uh, President Assad palaces. What can you tell us about what's going on in the city? So initially when Damascus fell, it was mainly to rebels who came from the south, the southern front. And these are not rebel groups which are directly controlled by Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, this group that came from the north. And as these groups from the south and from, you know, the southern suburbs of, of Damascus took over the city, there was a bit of looting, there was vandalism, people were going into government buildings, the presidential palace. I think what we saw this afternoon was HTS moved into the city and have really instilled a lot more discipline. So those videos you've seen of people looting government offices, that's, that's stopped. HTS has instilled, you know, a modicum of, of control. And, um, you know, just in the last half hour or so, we saw Jelani, the head of HDS, he, he made a, a public appearance, his first public appearance in, in, in Damascus. He, he went to the Umayyad Mosque, you know, the most famous mosque in Damascus and, and gave a short. Um, so for now, it's I don't know if you can hear that gunfire. You know, there's still some stuff going on. I don't know if that's fighting. I don't know if that's celebratory. You know, about an hour ago, we heard an Israeli airstrike on the nearby Meze. Um, Air base, which is just a few miles away from where I am now. So, you, you know, this is a different Syria. This is a very different Syria to the one yesterday, but it's it's not over. And, you know, there's still tastes, flickers of war. We can see, feel and, and hear them. Gareth, what have the people that you've managed to speak to in your brief time since reaching Damascus been telling you, the people who are not part of the rebel forces, but the residents of Damascus? Because, of course, amongst this celebration, there's also the question of what happens next. Yeah, I think, you know, Syrians are allowing themselves to enjoy this moment. And um, we don't begrudge them at, at at all. Everyone I've spoke to so far has been absolutely positive about what's happened. And I, and I think you can see that from the videos that came out, not just from Damascus, but other parts of Syria. You know, by the end of it, we had statues of Bashar al-Assad and his father, Hafez al-Assad, being pulled down in Latakia, in Tartus. These are areas, you know, this is the Alawite heartland. And if there's any areas that should support Assad, it was these areas. But by the end of it, everyone was on board with this toppling of his regime. You know, at, at the start of the Syrian revolution, the phrase was Assad or we burn the country. And it seems like by the end of it, it was Assad versus the whole country. Um, I honestly haven't spoken to anyone who isn't ecstatic at what's happened in the last 24 hours, last few days. And I think Syrians know there are big questions. What comes next? You know, what, what is going to govern Syria 
nobody has those answers at the minute and nobody's really clear about what HTS plans are now that, you know, they've swept aside this regime which has just dominated Syria for decades. I think people are just enjoying the moment. Uh, any uh, word at all in what you're picking up locally in Damascus on the whereabouts of President Assad? No, there's a lot of speculation. Nobody seems to know. Um, you know, there were some rumours that he'd taken off in a private jet, which was shot down over Homs. I've heard from other sources that he wasn't shot down, that he made it to a Russian airbase and has safely left the country. Um we don't know at the minute, but I'm sure that is a, you know, if, if he's still alive, I'm sure that's a question that's going to be answered in, in the coming days because a lot of Syrians would like to know uh, where he is. Well, Gareth, uh, you're under curfew. You're in Damascus. What are your plans for this evening? I mean, we're just taking stock. We're, we're, we're kind of soaking up the atmosphere of, of, of a new Syria. Um, we might head out, we're, you know, we're seeing what's possible. This is such a dynamic situation. You know, there's various different armed groups controlling different parts of the city. Um, so, you know, we're, we're sort of figuring out as, as we go along, but, you know, every Syrian wants to share their story, especially in Damascus. And, you know, just checking into this hotel now, there was massive smiles on the faces of all the staff. So, you know, for now, I'm, I'm listening to their story. And, um, you know, it's enchanting. It's, it's enchanting to see the relief, the ecstasy, the happiness on the faces of everyone I've come across so far. Gareth, thank you so much uh, for giving us your time. Uh, really appreciate you being able to speak to us as one of the first uh, international journalists to reach Damascus. Gareth Brown, Middle East correspondent for The Economist, who made it uh, from uh, Beirut to Damascus there. Gareth, thank you. Um, what an extraordinary story. What an extraordinary time to be there. Uh, very glad to have been able to speak to Gareth. Now, people across the UK and the world have come out in the streets to celebrate the fall of Bashar al-Assad's regime after rebels took control of the several key cities in a matter of just 12 days. Well, let's speak now to Nihad Asamini, the head of business development and partnerships with Action for Humanity, a Syrian national who attended the gatherings in Manchester and recorded that clip for us. Uh, Nihad, thank you so much for giving us your time. Thank you so much for, for hosting me today. It's a great day for, for many Syrians, actually. Uh, Nihad, we've spoken to many Syrians who, who, who are still in a state of disbelief. Uh, Imad was telling us he was speaking to his sister-in-law only today in Damascus, who was still worried about talking about uh, the president over the phone. She found it almost unbelievable that such a thing could happen. What are your thoughts? It's absolutely a historic day for, for us. And uh, while many doubted this day would come, the unwavering hope prayers of Syrians have been answered finally. We mark, of course, a new chapter in Syria. This morning, I actually messaged my own family and also my friends. I was saying like, please, if I'm dreaming, can someone please confirm this to me? Absolutely, we were hoping this day will come, uh, but actually with the, with the dark years we, we lived through, we were not anticipating actually this is coming so uh, finally for us to have the freedom. What are your plans now, Nihad? Uh, many people we've been speaking to today have been looking into ways they can go back to Syria, whether it is to visit or to go back permanently. How are you feeling right now? I'm, I'm actually committed for, for, for the cause. Act, uh, I really wanted to go even when it started, and I have been exploring even through my own organization how we can uh, cross the border and go uh, there because we do have actually a massive team inside. We have been responding since 2011, and I wanted to go back. Uh, however, of course, always as we suffered through the last uh, 13, 14 years, it's always about border permissions and also how we can access the country. I'm eager to go back. I really want to go help rebuild Syria. What do you think happens next with Syria? Of course, the whole world has been celebrating uh, the fall of uh, a tyrant in Bashar al-Assad. But 
What happens next? Are you clear as to what the next few weeks will hold for Syria and its people? Yeah, it is despite the hope this day brings. The humanitarian needs in Syria remain actually really um, one of the biggest challenges. Uh, millions face extreme poverty, food insecurity, limited access to basic services uh, such as clean water and health care. Uh, we have between 13 million between internally displaced and refugees uh, outside the country, the economic collapse in the country as well. So all of those uh, challenges after years of conflict left uh, widespread destruction in, uh, uh, and also weakened the country. Homes, schools, hospitals, and entire communities need rebuilding. Uh, this requires sustained sustain support and investment in restore uh, the, the the communities and also uh, restore also those uh, in essential infrastructure. Are you hoping to see the West be part of that rebuilding of Syria? What are you hoping from countries like the UK and the US and the rest of the West? I, I mean, it's the time for the international community at this critical to 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 play actually their their support and also to play and to to provide the support through this transition uh, period. I really argue uh, governments, organizations, and even individuals to come together to meet the needs. Uh, to meet the immediate needs and invest in the uh, Syria future. We believe we are one day closer to brighter future in Syria, but also let's let today be a reminder of the power and hope that we can bring to Syria and also rebuild a stronger Syria uh, for, for people in those countries. It's absolutely, we lived through uh, more than 13 years, uh, almost 14 years actually of destruction. So it's the time now to rebuild, to restore, and also to, to invest more in, in building the whole country. What do you know about your hometown of Idlib uh, in Syria? Have you been able to speak to anybody there? And do you know what, what state the town has been left in? Um, I have been, of course, uh, on a daily contact with with my uh, with my family in Idlib and also with my friends. Um, few a few days ago, with the Russian airstrike, actually hit uh, five hospitals in Idlib and also many civilian houses. One of my family house also being destroyed by that airstrike. Luckily, all my, my family were safe, like they were out of the, of the house at that time. Uh, currently, it's just the, the, the celebration. People, they are celebrating that and they are also enjoying the moment. Uh, you could feel it also because Idlib was hosting from all other governorates and also from all cities, people displaced to Idlib and they were living in Idlib uh, before. So now you start hearing the stories about those families. They start going back to their homes and also uh, to their villages and to their towns. It's a mixed feeling between you because they build already those friendship uh, relationships with, with, with the people or residents of Idlib or people from Idlib. So now they are going back to their homes it's mixed feeling between, it's of course happiness for them, but also that we'll be missing them. You will be missing your neighbors. You will be missing also uh, friends uh, already in Idlib. So this is what I got from uh, the people I'm talking to, uh, including family and friends mm. 